Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It is Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock p.m., and that means, of course, it is time for our midweek Bible study. We greet you this evening in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ from the great state of Alabama. We have been engaged in a a study which I have titled Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night, in which we're looking at uh, spiritual things, supernatural things, paranormal things, from a biblical Christian perspective. We've come to the conclusion, as I've stated, <clears throat> that... Uh, we absolutely understand from a biblical perspective <clears throat> that the spirit realm is very real, that the spirit realm can, in fact, interact with the physical realm. Uh, we have determined, according to the scriptures, that there is no mention whatsoever in the Word of God of ghosts. There is no mention in the Word of God of hauntings. Uh, none of these things, there's no room made in Scripture for either of these things. However, the Word of God does speak very clearly and very plainly that within the spirit realm there are two um, classifications of spiritual beings which are able to also manifest themselves in the natural as a flesh and blood natural being. And um, those classifications, of course, are angels and demons. And uh, so, we want to continue with our study this week. Last week we began um, a little segment that I've called Things to Consider. And we're just, we're looking at some very practical thinking from a practical standpoint about a few things and then looking at what scripture says concerning them. Honestly, if people would just use a little bit of common sense instead of blindly believing everything that the self-proclaimed paranormal experts and what have you put out there. And they're speaking from a place of uh, absolutely no authority. They're, they're basically just talking off the top of their head. And if anything, they're quoting others' theories and conjectures and what the Word of God refers to as the imaginations. In other words, just stuff we come up with, you know, uh, evil imaginations and thoughts of the heart, just stuff we produce to try to offer explanations rather than turning to the Word of God, which is our eternal and absolute source. And we believe as children of God today that we can certainly trust the word of the Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And there are those people who uh, don't want to believe that. There are those people who want to say, oh, you know, well, empirical evidence, talking to these spirits and what they tell us isn't what the Bible says. So I'd rather believe what these spirits tell us and what have you. Well, that's all well and good, but when these spirits get out of hand and uh, go rogue, as it were, and all of a sudden things turn very ugly, and you're trying to deal with them, and, you're, and you need to get rid of them, and what have you, um, it's amazing how people who refuse to turn to the Word of God wind up uh, perpetually dealing with these issues, and they cannot seem to get victory and overcome these things, and they wind up becoming vexed and tormented 
by the spiritual influences for de many people for decades. Anyway, we want to go to the Lord in prayer this uh, uh, evening as we begin our study. So let's bow our heads. Master, we love you, God, today. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity always to come before you, to break forth the bread of life that we might learn and understand those spiritual things which you would have us to know and understand. Many people, Lord, have to deal with influences which come into their lives and they don't know how to obtain and maintain victory. And it is our goal, it is our intention in presenting this study that we might present them with the information they need. Lord, to come into relationship with you that they might walk in victory and be able to overcome all the powers of the enemy. Master, open the word of the Lord for us tonight. Open our understanding. Help us to be able to embrace and understand that which we hear. For we need your assistance in this endeavor. We ask it all tonight in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. All right. So I've titled this particular um segment last week in this, I've titled it Things to Consider. And uh, we were talking about basically just some very practical uh, issues, looking at things from a very practical standpoint. Last week, for instance, we were talking about, you know, why is it that ghosts, which are supposed to be human spirits, wear clothing, jewelry, shoes, you know, are, do, do, are these things also spiritual in nature? Are they also comprised of energy? Do they also travel with us into the spirit realm? And of course, we understand the word of God tells us that no, we come into this world naked and we depart this world naked. Uh, we cannot carry anything in, the scriptures declare, nor can we carry anything out. We talked about uh, how a so-called ghost can inflict physical damage or injury to anyone in the natural world. How is it possible that a spiritual entity would be able to do this if indeed it is spiritual, it is a spirit? And uh, we talked about the fact that um, some people try to suggest that uh, ghosts eat or drink. You know, oh, well, I put my grandma's favorite cookie out on the counter, and when I came out the next morning, it had been eaten, you know, and that was her favorite cookie. Well, it makes very little sense when you understand that as a spiritual being, there's no need to consume food. There's no need to eat in order to survive. And there is no physical mechanism whereby one could do so. Therefore, anything that is able to do so must somehow be able to cross that line between the spiritual and the physical. Now, Scripture makes no room for ghosts. However, it does make room. It does speak of angels coming to the assistance of people, angels appearing to us at times uh, in a sense to test us, to see how we're going to respond to someone in need or someone in distress. And... Uh, uh, the Word of God said, be careful how you entertain strangers, because many have uh, entertained angels unawares. So that homeless person that you snarl or get snarky with may very well be an angel that is simply there for a short time to see how you're going to react to them. And uh, God is watching. He's paying attention. Um 
But by the same token, of course, there are demon spirits. The entire purpose of the demonic realm <clears throat> is to draw people away from the knowledge of God. Their, their purpose is to draw us away from the higher knowledge of a living God. So therefore, they engage in any number of deceptive activities <clears throat> that ultimately are going to cause us to question what the Word of God says, to question what the Word of God teaches. It is not merely a matter of what these uh, invisible spirits say that is deceptive, but also it is uh, how they act and how they behave, uh, things they do that leave us with impressions or leave us with thoughts that then bring into question the Word of God. For instance, even the notion of Grandma eating these cookies, for instance, you know, well, I I bought uh, this particular kind of cookie. You know, my favorite happens to be white chocolate macadamia nut. I love white chocolate and macadamia nut cookies. And if I were to pass and Tommy were to buy a package of white chocolate macadamia nut cookies, and then all of a sudden, you know, every night he's coming out to the kitchen to find that one of those cookies has been eaten, uh, he might draw the conclusion that, well, huh, Charles must be hanging around. Charles must be uh, staying nearby because these were his favorite cookies. The only problem with that is, notice that the ghost, the spirit, so-called, has not said a word, but just by reason of the activity, the suggestion is made, number one, that after death, our spirit can choose to linger, can choose to remain in the earth. Whereas the Word of God teaches plainly and clearly that the dead, uh, the spirit of man returns to God. It once again becomes God's possession after death, and God is the one who determines where that spirit goes, uh, where that spirit is going to ride out uh, the time between their death and uh, the ultimate resurrection of the dead. The Word of God teaches that one day all the dead are going to be resurrected. Uh, we're not talking about the rapture of the church. We're talking about the ultimate end of this age when the dead are going to rise, both the wicked and the uh, righteous, and we will stand before the judgment throne, the judgment seat of Christ, otherwise known as the great white throne. And we will uh, answer at that time for two things. <clears throat> Our response to the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, the deeds which we have done in the flesh. By reason of our response to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that will determine whether or not we uh, gain access to God's heaven, okay, and to eternity in the presence of God. Um, we still, even as a believer, we're still going to answer for the deeds done in the flesh. When we have said things that have harmed people, hurt people, when we have done things that were offensive and purposely harmful and hateful and mean-spirited, so on and so forth, we are going to answer for those things. We will not lose our inheritance of eternal life. However, the Word of God often talks about people who do certain things are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And, and what, I, what I love about Christians is we love to pile everything into uh, the same pile. You know, we love to, to just 
group things together and put everything together. And we say, well, and when it says they will not inherit the kingdom, then that means they're not going to have eternal life. No, that is not what it says. It says they will not inherit the kingdom. Uh, there are many aspects of God's heaven that are going to be uh, glorious and splendorous and wonderful. They are part of uh, part and parcel of the kingdom of heaven. And uh, there are going to be some people, the word of God refers to uh, making it by the skin of their teeth. They're, they're, in essence, they're just barely going to uh, obtain eternal life. But the Word of God teaches that we are to lay up our treasures in heaven where dust and moth doth not corrupt and where thieves do not come in to steal. People don't understand. For the believer, it's not a he everything that comes along is not heaven or hell. It's not eternal life or eternal punishment for for the believer, no. For the believer, you are going to stand before God in the judgment, but you're going to experience a different type of judgment. There is therefore now no condemnation to them, no condemnation to them, which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Uh, but... The Word of God teaches that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reward every man according to his works. So again, I keep, you know, those of you who have followed my teaching and my preaching for any length of time, you know that I'm constantly, constantly, constantly harping on the biblical principles. The Word of God tells us that the truth of God is given to us Line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. It is a big jigsaw puzzle that God has called us to sincerely uh, seek out and seek to put together. But in order to do that, we have to understand that no single piece shows the entire picture by itself. No, every single scripture, every single passage of scripture must be viewed in terms of how does it fit into the whole. If you've ever looked at a jigsaw puzzle, they don't have, you know, a patch of flowers all in one piece so that as you're putting the puzzle together, you have these gigantic pieces, and each piece uh, represents, you know, some entire portion of the picture. No, there are hundreds of pieces that you must put together just to put the house together. Then there are hundreds of pieces you must put together in order to put the landscaping together. There are hundreds of pieces you must put together to put the skyline and the sunset together. So <clears throat> the same is true of the Word of God. Every single passage, every single piece is but a part of the whole. And to understand any doctrine or any truth, we must understand that no single passage is going to say something that simply, quote-unquote, stands alone and makes a statement all by itself, because this is where we come into contradiction. And there are many people who say, well, but the Bible's full of contradictions, and many Christians fall away from the faith because they feel there are too many contradictions, and they cannot understand the, what appears to be a contradiction. But if you put the pieces together, line upon line, precept upon precept, all of a sudden, in the big picture, you're like, aha, wait a minute. Now I get it. Now I see. This appeared to be saying one thing in and of itself. However, when we 
uh, put it in context of the whole, what this is saying is this rather than this. And um, it's not that what it's saying is not true in and of itself, but the, it may be part of a higher principle or, or a greater spiritual truth. All right, so when the human being dies, their spirit returns to God. The Word of God teaches they're one of two places of waiting for the believer to be absent, uh, excuse me, the, the dead, to be absent from the body. The Word of the Lord teaches for believers is to be present with the Lord. Those who are not part of God's family, they will not be able to, to wait out the resurrection in his presence. And the word of God said that Lazarus died and went to Abraham's bosom. This is prior to the Lord's resurrection. So God's heaven was not available as of yet to anyone. And then the rich man died and went to hell. And so there are two destinations. We're either in the presence of God or we are uh, in the presence of the God of this world whom we served in this life. So therefore, a spirit can allude to or suggest or imply certain things that contradict the word of God simply by reason of a certain action. You know, again, I keep pointing to that cookie, you know, eating that cookie. But that's just the example I'm trying to use. I don't want to use a number of different examples because I really want to uh, drive this point home and help you to understand it. You know, so in the case of the cookie being eaten, the Spirit has not said a word. It's not about it communicating to something to us verbally that contradicts scripture. No, it has communicated something to us non-verbally that contradicts the word of God. After death, a person has the choice. They can linger around. They can decide to stay. They can be confused. They can be this. They can be that. And they can be stuck here and blah, blah, blah. All these things which the word of God has made no room for whatsoever. And uh, so, therefore, if we believe that these ghosts and these spirits are, in fact, the dead, somehow interacting within the world of the living, then the Word of God may as well be thrown out the window. There, there's no room for the Word of God anymore. And if the Word of God can't be trusted, then obviously there's no need of salvation. There's no need to repent. There's no need to believe the gospel. There's no need to believe in Jesus Christ. None of these things. If the word of God is not dependable, then my friend, the entirety of its message is invalid and void. And this is ultimately what the spirit realm, the deceptive spirit realm on the demon side is wanting to convince you of. If you watch these paranormal shows, if you watch these different programs, and you look at the activity they claim occurs, if you look at the uh, message being conveyed by reason of this activity, then you can easily say and easily see, okay, so this spirit is convincing people by reason of this activity that the dead uh, can choose to stay around. For instance, I just saw a program the other day <clears throat> with you know one of these famous uh, mediums, and I'm convinced pretty much that this lady probably, I'm pretty sure she's operating with a familiar spirit. A familiar spirit is a demonic spirit that works with an individual and uh, or attaches itself to an individual. And this familiar spirit can appear to the, to the psychic or to the medium over and over again as hundreds of different people. 
Oh, your mother's here. Oh, yes, your mother's here. And your mother said thus and so, and blah, blah, blah. And again, the person becomes convinced. Oh, my mother is still here. And the psychic said, yes, she chose to stay because you're her world. And she chose to stay so that she could be close to you and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> okay, so where's God? Where's God in all this? Um, is the scripture then that tells us that after death, the spirit of man returns to God? Is that null and void? Is, does that mean then that this is not accurate according to these mediums? Well, you know, this spirit um, hasn't gone to the light. This spirit hasn't passed on to the next realm. Uh, they chose to stay for other reasons, and blah, 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 blah. And when you listen to everything they're saying, all they're doing is creating doubt and contradiction to the Word of God. And ultimately, by reason of the things that are experienced or the things that they say, we are drawn into a mindset that obviously the Word of God is useless. Obviously, the, the Word of God is useless. Uh, just like, for instance, a person who has um, never lived a life of faith and never uh, been a person who embraced or believed the gospel, and then as a ghost, so-called, they come back and they communicate with the living, whether it be their loved one, whether it be a medium or a psychic, you know, that, uh, oh, I'm in a better place, I'm at peace, you know, I'm in heaven, blah, blah, blah. Well, now what have we learned? We learned that our loved one who never had any thought toward God in the universe, never had any interest in the gospel of Jesus Christ, never had any interest in anything, even remotely religious, um, somehow or another made heaven. So therefore, we don't need God. We don't need the gospel. We don't need Jesus Christ to make heaven either. After all, mommy just was nice to people and she used to bake cookies for the neighbors and so on and so forth. So now we understand that the demonic realm's sole purpose and intention is to deceive. And folks, they come at it from so many different directions, it isn't even funny. Okay, They suggest so many different things. It's not like they have one story that they tell and they stick to that one story. No, no, no. Um, if you listen to all these different paranormal experts and all these different psychics and all these different mediums and all these so-called experts. It is amazing how many different theories and how many different ideas and how many different imaginations they have. You can have two or three different teams go to the same location and uh, investigate the same identical place, and yet they'll all come away with different uh, theories and different diagnoses of what is going on. And uh, we as believers are going to trust the Word of God. Now, I've talked about the fact that... Um, Let me see. Hold on one minute. I want to make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. Because I don't want to do that. It'd be just like me to do that. Okay. So we're asking questions that help us to think critically about so-called ghosts interaction. We asked last week, for instance, why would a human spirit seek to scare or inspire fear in an individual to whom they are manifesting themselves. We talked about the fact that the Word of God tells us plainly and clearly that God has not given us the spirit of fear. 
we've talked about the fact that whenever there is a uh, manifestation that comes from God, whether it be the Lord himself appearing to his disciples or appearing to uh, even after the resurrection. Now, he wasn't a spirit, but his sudden appearance obviously scared them, caused them to be afraid. And the first thing the Lord says is, fear not, don't be afraid. Uh, when he walked on the water and they're seeing something that defied science and defied nature. And the word of God said they thought that perhaps they had seen a ghost because even back then, spirits were doing the same thing they're doing today. So there was a belief even back then in ghosts, even though nowhere in the word of God, Old or New Testament, uh, is the concept of a ghost uh, endorsed or set forth. And what did the Lord say? Even from a distance, he said, be not afraid, it is I. So God does not allow fear. He does not permit fear. If God has anything in the world to do with it, if an angel appears to you, then the first thing they're going to say is, do not be afraid. Yet, People see ghosts, and their immediate reaction is fear. And how often do these people say that even if this quote-unquote ghost is not appearing in a manner to scare them, you know, it's not doing anything or looking any way that necessarily is intended to scare them. But if just in their seeing it, if they're terrified, there was one story I saw of an actor who had gone into a Canadian museum as a young man to write an article about the museum because it was uh, uh, well known to be haunted. <clears throat> and as he was exploring the museum during the night, he decided to go up to the fourth floor of this particular museum where they had a bunch of uh, displays of animals, you know, that were stuffed and, you know, um, and he was by this one display and he said, uh, all of a sudden he was asleep. He said, all of a sudden I just felt this, something woke me up. I don't know what it was. I just felt <coughs> stirred to wake up said, I woke up and I looked and he said, and there was a man standing just staring at me, just looking at me. And he said, I never felt so much fear in my life. I never felt so afraid in my life. And he said, after a couple of minutes, this man just dissipated and disappeared. He said, man, I got up out of there, grabbed my stuff and I ran out of that museum scared out of my mind. Folks, that is not anything godly. The very fact that this experience generated fear in this man, and nowhere in that interaction was this man encouraged to not be fearful. Had it had anything in the universe to do with God, had it been anything good, immediately there would have been a call to be not afraid. So this is one way that we can judge and we can measure whether or not something is potentially of God or not of God. The enemy loves fear. The enemy, Satan loves fear. Demons love fear. They're, they're not going to discourage you from being afraid under any circumstances. Even if you think you're seeing grandma and you're terrified because you think all of a sudden you're seeing your grandma, they're not going to say a word. They're not going to do a thing in the universe to not make you feel afraid. No, they enjoy a fear reaction. I guess in some way you could say they get a kick out of a fear reaction, okay? So now... We want to continue. Uh, we want to ask the question, why is it that 
ghosts, so-called, often appear, and they appear as a family member, someone with whom we are related, and especially in the case of husbands and wives, uh, there are some instances where uh, I've actually seen stories where the ghost, so-called, of a spouse appeared to the living spouse, and they actually engaged in some form of intimacy. And uh, the Word of God tells us in Matthew 22, 23 through 33, The same day came to him, meaning Jesus, the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master Moses said, If a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, listen, knowing, not knowing the Scriptures. See, the Word of God is, he's saying, if you, if you knew the Scriptures, you wouldn't be asking this foolish question, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. There's an important distinction to be made. You'll notice the Lord specifies they are as the angels of God. He didn't just stop there because we understand demons are a form of an angel. Angels, as they're called, are the servants of God, but demons are uh, also angelic in nature. They're spiritual beings, just like the angels in heaven. But the Lord specifies that the angels in heaven are asexual. They, they have no genitalia. It's not about gender. There is no gender in God's heaven. After the resurrection, there is no gender. This is one reason why, uh, in the Word of God, when you read in the book of Revelation and what have you, that the scriptures constantly use uh, the male pronoun, and it, it doesn't use uh, both. You know, for instance, in Revelation, the Lord said, I will be their God, and they shall be my sons. Doesn't say my sons and my daughters. Doesn't even say they will be my children. That doesn't mean that in heaven everybody's going to be turned male. No. But it does mean that in heaven after the resurrection that there is no gender identification. We become, as a spiritual being, we become asexual. The entire necessity of and I'm going to talk plainly, folks, because I want you to understand what I'm saying. And I find that the only way for people to understand things is if the preacher talks plainly. I can't stand preachers who talk around everything, and, you know, and talk in circles. The whole necessity of male and female genitalia was necessitated by the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That it was at the moment of their fall, at their disobedience, that they were their nature was changed from that of a living soul, which is a spiritual being, to that of fallen man, now with a flesh and blood body, which is why 
all of a sudden they felt the need to cover themselves. Why didn't they feel the need to cover themselves when the scripture uses the term they were naked initially in the Garden of Eden? Uh, well, part of it is simply because Paul speaks of being naked as being outside of our natural body, outside of our physical body. The spiritual man by itself is naked. And I believe when the book of Genesis talks about Adam and Eve being naked, again using the principle line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. The word of the Lord said, God breathed into Adam's nostrils, and Adam became a living soul. That means he was a spiritual being. But at the moment of their disobedience, their nature changed. Instead of being above the world in which they lived, instead of being a higher creation, so that everything in this world, everything on this planet could be subject unto them, all of a sudden now, by reason of their eating from the tree which God had uh, not permitted them to eat from, they were demoted in nature. So, okay, you want to you wanna eat from that tree? Fine. Then that means you want to live in this world like all the other animals, like all the, you know, some people, there are some doctrines in some organizations that try to set forth that in the Garden of Eden, in the world before the fall, that lions didn't eat gazelles and uh, animals didn't hunt one another and they didn't eat one another and all this. Uh, I don't believe for a moment that that's accurate. No, God created the earth as it exists today. And he created an ecosystem. And all of these... Um, the food chain, as it were, all of these things contribute to the smooth operation and the proper functioning of the world as a whole. Okay? So Adam and Eve were able to interact with lions. They were able to interact with um, tigers and bears and any other so-called dangerous animal because their nature was higher than that of those animals. And uh, as a living soul, they were able to interact with anything and everything. They were able to do whatever and whenever and however they wanted to do. But when men fell, his nature changed. It is at that time only that procreation became necessary. Procreation is the continuance of life in the face of death. But the Lord said, In the day that thou eatest of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. Adam and Eve were not to know death until after they disobeyed God. Therefore, procreation prior to their disobedience was entirely unnecessary. There was no reason in the universe for Adam and Eve to procreate prior to the fall. The problem is people read the book of Genesis, they don't understand that uh, Moses wrote it under a prophetic anointing, whereas normally a prophet is writing in, uh, of future events and future things that God might reveal to him. In the, uh, in the case of Moses, God was revealing the past. He was showing Moses what had already transpired. But in the same identical way that a prophet has to describe future things the best way he knows how. If you're a prophet in the 4th in the, uh, century B.C. 
and you see a fighter plane, a, 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 a fighter jet, you're not going to know how to describe that jet. You're not going to call it a jet. You're not going to call it a plane. You see it shooting what appears to be fire, you know, it's it's uh, missiles and what have you, and other planes or whatever, and you may you may identify that plane as a dragon, a flying dragon. That may be how you describe it, because that's the best you can do based on what you're seeing. You that that's the best description you can offer it. The same thing was true of Moses looking backwards. Moses looking backwards was trying to describe creation, the beginning of all things, the best that he could from his perspective. And therefore, seeing Adam and Eve created in the image and likeness of God, by the way, God is not a man, the word of the Lord teaches us. He does not have flesh and blood. God breathed into Adam's nostrils, and Adam became a living soul, which would mean that in the likeness and image of God, Adam was a living soul. He was a spiritual being. At the fall, uh, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, their nature changed. Now they had to assume the male-female roles. Now they had to assume the male-female position. Initially, the Word of God tells us exactly why God created Eve, and it had nothing in the universe to do with procreation. Because again, initially, there was no need for procreation. Initially, God created Eve, A, because Adam was alone. He said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will create for him a helpmate. So he created Eve to be two things for Adam. To be a companion and a helper. Had nothing in the universe to do with intimacy. Had nothing in the universe to do with sexuality. Human sexuality and procreation is the byproduct of the fall. Some of y'all are saying, Pastor, I don't know why you're going into all this. Well, I, there's a reason. I, there's a method to my madness. So these things became the byproduct of the fall. Human sexuality period, is as much the byproduct of our flesh and blood existence as is death. After death, after the resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ said, they neither marry or are given in marriage, but are as the angels in heaven, asexual. We return to the same identical state that Adam and Eve began in. Once again, we return as resurrected believers. The Word of God says that uh, the soul of the believer will never die. We return as living souls. Living souls are a sexual. I believe with all my heart, Adam and Eve originally were created asexual. They did not assume male-female gender until after the fall. If you look at the full testimony of the book of Genesis, you will find that Adam and Eve did not ever engage in procreation. Nowhere. If procreation was so important to God. If that was his whole purpose in creating Adam, uh, Eve for Adam, then they must have disobeyed God because nowhere prior to the fall did Adam and Eve procreate. No. We read in Scripture, it was not until after they were ejected from the garden alone they had no offspring. They had no children. They were ejected from the garden, now flesh and blood, now physically male-female with the accompanying 
genitalia because now in order to continue life in the face of imminent death, they had to procreate. It was not until after the fall that Adam and Eve began to procreate. So where man started is where God is going to restore us. The entire plan of salvation, the entire work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, folks, was not designed to take us somewhere that humanity had never been. No! The purpose of the cross, the purpose of salvation, the purpose of our faith is so that we might be restored to that place that Adam existed in prior to the fall. So if after the resurrection we're neither married nor given in marriage, got news for you, prior to the fall, Adam and Eve were not married or given in marriage. Nowhere do we see God um, performing any ceremony or joining them. No, the Word of God teaches us plainly. In order to be married, there's one ingredient you have to have, flesh. Because the Word of God teaches that the two become one. How? By reason of intimacy, by reason of uh, intercourse, to be frank and honest, which is why the Apostle Paul cautioned us to be careful who we hook up with, because every time we hook up with somebody, we are in effect joining ourselves to them and, and uniting ourselves with them. All right, so now, having said that, I want to point to the fact tonight that... Um, We're talking about uh, human spirits, so-called, maintaining earthly relationships. Well, the scripture tells us no, that is not going to be the case. Why? Because when we return to our uh, state, our spiritual state as a living soul, we know a fullness and a completeness and a reality that we cannot know or understand in this physical life. And we know ourselves and we understand ourselves as a child of God. When after death, it's not about still being in love with our husband, still being in love with our wife, you know, uh, still maintaining a parental relationship over somebody. No, folks, all of those things are part and parcel of our natural flesh and blood experience. But when you ascend into that spiritual state, you transcend this life. So that all earthly relationships now are meaningless. They're, they're dissipated. Now, the Apostle Paul did tell us that we shall be known even as also we were known. So that means in heaven, are we going to know one another? Are we going to recognize one another? Are we going to understand that on the, uh, in this life, that was my mother. In this life, that was my father. Whatever the case might be. Yes, you probably will. However, will they in the next world be your father, your mother, your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister? No. In the next life, we will all be brothers we will all be the children of God through Jesus Christ, period. And the only relationship that matters after the resurrection, the only relationship that matters when we leave this body is our relationship with God. Okay, so having said that, why is it that some people claim... Uh, that so-called ghosts, the spirits of human beings, uh, are actually able to engage in intimacy and sexual activity. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, well, brother, that's crazy. There's nobody in this world who actually would suggest that um, 
they've had sex with a ghost. Well, let me share something with you. This is a stream that appeared on Reddit. And in this stream, this woman writes and says, Yeah, you know, I've been intimate with a ghost. Now, I'm not able to show you the whole stream. There's a whole bunch of people responding to this. And there are any number of people who are claiming that they too have had intimate contact with ghosts. There is a article that appeared in uh, Newsweek in which the writer stated Is it possible to have sex with a ghost? And this writer says, this British writer says that she does it and is loving it. Okay? Now, we've understood, we've heard over the years about the incubus. The incubus, by definition, being a demon in male form that seeks to have sexual intercourse with sleeping women. And then, of course, there is the corresponding um, demon spirit referred to as a succubus, which is a female evil spirit or demon who has sexual intercourse with sleeping men. So, why on earth would anyone believe that a dead person, the spirit of a human being, would be able to have intercourse. First of all, the word of the Lord teaches us that our familiar relationships are no more after death. Secondly, why on earth would, how on earth, I should say, can a spiritual form, a spiritual being, have physical interaction with the physical world. Now, the experts, the so-called paranormal experts, you know, they, they love, I've, I've said it before, I'll say it again, they love to set forth this theory that after death we all become Harry Potter and magically, poof, we can make all kinds of things. We can appear however we want to appear. We can manifest ourselves however we want to manifest ourselves. On one hand, they tell us that if a ghost can move a thimble across a table, Woo, that takes a lot of power for that ghost to move that thimble across the table. And yet we've also seen incidents where entire pieces of furniture are turned over. I've told you my own personal experience of helping a friend to rearrange a room full of furniture, going into the bedroom to help him flip his mattress and make his bed, only to come back out into the living room Every single piece of furniture, sofas, tables, lamps, everything, returned to the position they were in initially. And yet, to hear the experts tell it, oh, these are just human spirits, you know, and uh, they've really got to have a lot of energy. They've got to have a lot of power to be able to, to move a piece of paper or to move a thimble across the table. And yet, we see all the time incidents where tables are turned over, furniture is flipped over, heavy objects are lifted and moved. And uh, so apparently these ghosts, these human spirits have really taught themselves, boy, how to Harry Potter it up like it's going out of style. Or we can believe the word of God and understand that we're not talking about human spirits. We know from a biblical perspective, we know, A, there's no room for ghosts. There's no, no mention of ghosts. There's no uh, endorsement of ghosts and hauntings in Scripture. But we know that demon spirits can do 
all of the things these people tried to ascribe to ghosts. We know that a demon spirit can manifest itself in the spiritual world, in the physical world. We know that a demon spirit has the energy, the power to manifest itself any way it wishes to manifest itself. The word of God teaching that even Satan himself is able to appear as an angel of light. So he's literally able to transform himself so that he appears the utter and complete opposite of what he is in reality by nature. Uh, so therefore, if we look at it from a biblical Christian perspective, all of these things they're trying to ascribe to so-called human ghosts, the Word of God tells us that demons can do. And we know that demons can do this. So while I was doing my research and I'm reading this Reddit uh, stream and all this that cracked me up, there were people there who claimed to be sensitives and claimed to be uh, mediums and what have you. And they said, oh, I've had sex with any number of ghosts, you know. Oh, but I require they introduce themselves to me. I require that they make themselves known to me before uh, I allow them, you know, to do anything and blah, blah, blah. Folks, if you think what the Word of God says concerning um the days of Noah, if you think what the scriptures say concerning the days of Noah is far-fetched and crazy, listen, do a little bit of research on the internet, and you'll find that even today, people are engaging in this same wickedness. They are purposely inviting, welcoming uh, ex accepting spiritual beings, and they're foolish enough to believe that these are human spirits, to interact with them at a sexual level. Now, we know from a biblical perspective that this would literally be utterly impossible if it were a human spirit. Because first of all, the human spirit after death becomes asexual. So so how is, how is that even possible? But they want to claim, well, but the human spirit can manifest itself in the, in the physical world to the extent that it can engage in sexual activity. Well, nowhere in the Bible is that taught. However, we do know, and I'm going to read to you from the uh, New International Version so that it is clear. Genesis 6, 1 through 4, when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, this is referring to demons, saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever for they are mortal, their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The, Neph the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old men of renown. When the word of God said the sons of God married them, Engaging in intercourse is marriage. Intimacy uh, is marriage, okay, it, uh, by, bi by biblical definition. They didn't go in front of a preacher and have a ceremony. No, every time these people who now in today's world claim that they are laying down with, with quote-unquote human spirits and engaging in intimacy, they are in effect marrying these spirits. This is the apex of what the Word of God considers to be evil and ungodly conduct. You are purposefully offering yourself to a demon spirit, albeit many people do not realize they're offering themselves to a demon spirit 
but that is in reality and in, and in fact what they're doing. If they could see, if they could literally see what they were interacting with, and if they could see it in its truest form, it would scare the fire out of them. It would probably terrify them out of their mind. But foolishly, they want to believe the Word of God is inaccurate. They want to believe that Scripture is worthless and useless and nothing that is said in the Bible is factual or true. And I can do as I please and I can do as I want. And interestingly enough, the Lord Jesus Christ said, listen, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the day of the Son of Man. What did he say after that? He said, they'll be married and given in marriage. Meaning what? Well, in Noah's day, they were interacting sexually with demonic spirits. And it was defined as marrying. They were marrying themselves to these spirits. Well, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. Folks, we are literally seeing an uptick. We are seeing an increase. The more and more people in our world today want to believe, A, that the Word of God is inaccurate and holds no value for them, and B, that they can trust the invisible unseen, that they can believe every word that comes out of uh, the invisible world. They don't know who they're dealing with. There is no way on earth, I've said this before, there is no way on earth they can qualify or vet the so-called individual that they're speaking to. There's no way on earth they can vet it. They have to take it on faith. If this spirit says, my name is John, and I used to live here, and I died in this house, they have to take it on faith that that person is John who died in that house and used to live there. But what they're doing is they're believing deceptive demon spirits rather than believing what the Word of God teaches. Now, we understand that marriage bonds and familiar relationships are dissolved upon one's death. Nothing that ties us to the natural flesh and blood world remains. We are free, my friend, of all cares and worries. This includes being released from any sense of duty or obligation to our yet living loved ones. We will be known. How could anybody go to heaven and be happy? How could anybody find peace after death if they're going to continue to be concerned about those they've left behind, if they're going to be tied to those they've left behind. How is anybody in the world going to find peace? I adored my great-grandmother more than any person on this planet. I've talked about it before. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I believe with all my heart that Oh, glory, that my great-grandma is dancing and shouting around the throne of God, and I wouldn't want her anywhere else. I don't think she spends one second of the millenniums to come worrying about me or worrying about any member of my family. I don't believe for one second she comes and looks after us and tries to do things for us and try to help us. No, that is what God is for the believer. If you notice these so-called experts, these paranormal experts, they constantly are ascribing to ghosts the attributes of God and the responsibilities of God. Oh, well, you know, your dad, he, he lingers around you because he's protecting you and he's caring for you and he's watching out for you. No, no. The Word of God teaches 
that we're to trust the Lord for those things. We're to believe that God is looking out for us and God is watching out for us, that our Heavenly Father is taking care of us, that He is protecting us, that He is guarding us. But isn't it interesting how these experts will try to suggest that, oh, these human spirits come so that they can do all. Why would they need to do these things? Well, apparently because God's nowhere to be found. They would need to do these things because there is no God. So therefore, you need something in the invisible realm. You need something in the spiritual realm who can look out for you and protect you and take care of you. Because after all, God and angels, which work on God's behalf to do these very things, is non-existent and not real. So which are we going to believe? Are we going to believe the spirits, the ghosts, so-called, are we going to believe the word of God? We will be known in eternity as we were known on earth, but the family relationship will have ended as we all will stand before God alone as his child and part of the body and bride of Christ no longer a part of any other family or relationship. Spirits use familiar relationships in an effort to establish credibility and compassion. They appear as someone we have known or have been related to, as we are far more likely to believe someone we knew, obviously, than we would a perfect stranger. The emotional ties between an individual and the departed loved one is often potent enough to make many disbelieve God's word and embrace a belief which is contradictory to the Christian faith. After death, we fully realize the connection we have to the Lord our God and our family becomes that of the whole of the redeemed spirit realm. Revelation 21, 3 through 7, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, meaning the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Listen, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him. Notice you just see the male pronoun being used. But this, this is not implying simply quote-unquote males. But it's whenever the male is used, it's inclusive of all. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but that excites me. Glory to God. Amen. Uh, why is it that spirits always represent themselves as people or individuals who can be uh, readily tied to a property, a home, or a location? How is it that a human spirit, a ghost, never shows up somewhere that cannot be readily tied to that location? Well, demonic spirits are trying to appear as a human spirit, 
and therefore they most often represent themselves as individuals who could have lived or died at the given location. For instance, a Civil War era home is always being haunted by a Civil War veteran or soldier. Uh, has no one else ever died in that location during any other era or time period? You know, how come the, the World War II veteran who lived in that same house a hundred years after the Civil War, how come he never shows up? But no, the one we see is the Civil War era veteran. That's the guy whose ghost is constantly showing up. Well, of course, because it's about props. It's about using the history, using um, the history of the property, uh, uh, the history of the era. All of those things become props. They all become part of the set that these spirits were able to use in order to create a believable identity. And in creating a believable identity, people who don't know any better begin to give that spirit permission to be there. Because after all, well, you know, this old lady loved this house as much as I did. So if she wants to stay here, even though she's dead, she's certainly welcome to. Honey, you have just given a carte blanche to a demon spirit to live in your home with you. And that spirit was able to deceive you into believing that they were this person simply using the props, simply using the history of the property. Okay, yeah, there was an old lady that lived and died there, but the old lady is either in heaven or hell. Got news for you. She's in one of two places. But the reality is that spirit has convinced you that they are this person because they're using the history. They're using... Uh, people that have lived there, people who have died there, uh, you know, they're using the era, so on and so forth, okay? Um, it's so much easier to represent itself, the demon, as someone who can easily and readily be identified as having lived or died at that location. Um, do people never die tragic or horrible deaths at locations which never exhibit any signs of haunting or a spiritual presence? So we've got these experts that tell us, oh, if you die a horrible death, if you die a tragic death, if you die an untimely death, that, that ghost can get stuck here and be stuck here. And yet at the same time, there are people who die horrifically, who die tragically, who die prematurely uh, in any number of locations where a ghost is never reported, where no one ever suggests that they've seen or experienced a ghost. So again, these principles, these facts that these experts set forth are not even uniform. They're not even um, something that you can count on, they'll use that explanation when it's convenient. You know, when when they can go to that and say, oh, well, you know, this person died tragically here, so, you know, so now they're stuck here. But at the same time, is that true always? Well, no. Well, what, how come it's not true always? If it's, if it's true in, in this instance, why is it not true in that instance? What's the difference? Well, that person died tragically. They died suddenly. They died whatever. But they were ready for death. Really? Well, I thought the whole idea behind their dying tragically and their dying untimely and their, you know, I thought the whole idea of that was that People who die this way aren't ready to die. You know, the circumstance itself puts them in a position where they weren't ready to die. And yet, 
they can refer to these type of circumstances. And this person over here, oh, they just transitioned and they went on to the next world without a problem. But this person over here, some, what is the difference? The circumstances are similar. The circumstances are the same. What is the difference? Why are all your expert opinions and all your thought processes not true universally? doesn't make any sense. If it's true in one, it ought to be true in all. Why is it... Let me see. Yeah, why is it that all uh, people who die tragic and horrible deaths, why is it they don't all wind up becoming so-called earthbound spirits or ghosts? The laws of the spirit world, according to our paranormal experts, would then seem to be very sporadic and inconsistent. Let me ask you a question. What laws in nature, what laws in the scientific, are ever so inconsistent and unreliable? It's funny, in the natural world, things work consistently. That's the whole nature of science. The whole nature of science, you're, you're supposed to be able to study so that you can predict an outcome and then you can replicate it. You can cause it to happen again because you know it's going to happen because you've observed it and seen how it works. So if I boil water, it'll become steam. And I've determined that water, when boiled, becomes steam. So now I can take a pan of water, put it on a hot plate, and it'll become steam. I've replicated it because science is consistent. The natural world, the scientific world, is consistent. But we're told by our paranormal expert friends that the spirit realm is anything but consistent. They have so many explanations, so many reasons, so many thoughts and ideas for how this happened or why this happened and how this person somehow or another remains here. And there's absolutely no consistency whatsoever in their explanations. From a biblical perspective, we have a consistent understanding and a consistent explanation. Why is it, for instance, that EVP, electronic voice detection, seldom captures more than a sound that can be interpreted virtually any way the listener chooses to interpret it? You ever notice that? You ever no I, I, I laugh when I watch some of these shows, and all of a sudden on their little uh, recorder, they get a... And they said, did you hear it? It said, I'm your mother Gertrude from the land of Disney. How in the world did you get that out of that little <laughs> noise, you know? But it, it's amazing to me. These people will pull that stunt. And then when a spirit does say something complete, it does say something straight forth and they catch it electronically or scientifically. Uh, it's always just this littlest tiny blurb of information. But again, notice, it takes so much energy for these spirits to communicate, bless their hearts, that, you know, all they can get out is a few words. All they can, you know, they can't just stand there and speak um, entire paragraphs to us. They can't have a full-blown conversation with us because it takes so much energy for them. Yeah. Where do they get that from? What authority tells us that it requires so much energy for a spirit to do that? Or are these deceptive spirits offering just the littlest, tiniest blurbs so that we can, in essence, put it together any way we want to put it together? Uh, one of my favorite 
characters on television who uh, is famous for doing this, if you ever watch him, is this Zach Baggins guy. He, he kills me. He might get three uh, EVPs, and one will say candy bar. Next one will say murder. The next one will say Detroit. And then he'll say, are you telling us that you were murdered over a candy bar and your body was shipped to Detroit? Or he'll say, are you telling us that you were murdered while eating a candy bar as you were visiting Detroit? Or he'll say, are you telling us you were murdered in Detroit and that now you want a candy bar? You know, they take the little blurbs, the little speckled words that are offered, and put it together any old bloody way their imagination wants to put it together. And then they'll turn around, if you watch the show, they'll turn around later and present, well, we came to the determination that, blah, 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 and they'll put forth what they put together just out of their own imagination. They'll set that forth as somehow being fact. These people will meet with their so-called clients, and they'll tell the client, well, you know, we determined that, blah, 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 blah. And this is all foolishness they put together in their own head based on a word here, a word there, a phrase here. Folks, be discerning. Be discerning when you watch these sort of things. Look at it from a biblical Christian perspective. What message is being set forth by reason of what you're hearing or what you're seeing? What message is that spirit putting forth just by reason of manifesting itself as it manifests itself? One of the interesting things, I, I've got to say this, on that, in that same vein, and I'm almost done today, when you see these really wicked and evil characters, these people who are nasty, you know, oh, the ghost of this man uh, who murdered a prostitute in this hotel back in the wild, wild west, you know. He was known to be a violent man, and, blah, 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 and he murdered this prostitute and stuff. And then all of a sudden, this ghost is showing up, and he's tormenting and vexing uh, somebody that's staying at the hotel and and all these violent things are happening and they're getting scratched and and uh, uh, knickknacks and furniture are being turned over and and scratches are appearing on the wall and these experts are well you know these evil people in life are evil even after death yeah but do you know what else you're saying? Do you know what else you're conveying to people who do not have faith and confidence in the Word of God? You're telling us that somebody who's lived a wicked and evil life, who according to Scripture would wind up uh, in hell, has chosen to hang around and continue to be evil and wicked even after death, and that they can make that choice. So you're telling people, you don't have to fear God's judgment. You don't have to fear. And I don't mean fear in, in the sense of being terrified or afraid. I mean, when you say somebody fears um, the law or they fear their parents, you know, doesn't mean they're terrified of them. It doesn't mean you're afraid of them. It means that you give them a place in your thinking, okay? Um I fear my parents, therefore, uh, when I make decisions, I take into consideration how they have taught me and what they have taught me and what they have instructed me to do and how they have taught me to behave. That's what the term fear means when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. doesn't mean you have to be terrified of God. No, it means you give God a place in your thinking. 
Therefore, you, you contemplate when you make decisions, when you do things, you take into account what God has taught us and how the Lord has instructed us to conduct ourselves and to behave. Uh, but you see, again, this is an example of how these spirits, just by reason of manifesting themselves and doing certain things, are conveying messages that are in complete contradiction to the Word of God. And their job, demon spirits' job, is to deceive. Ultimately, they want to make you believe anything and everything except what the Word of the Lord teaches. In many ways, uh, or I should say in many years of experience in uh, deliverance ministry and dealing with demonic spirits, I have found that demon spirits most often do not want their activity captured on film or voice recorders. Many devices will not even work at all properly when there is a spiritual presence. EVPs usually, quote-unquote, pick up some anomaly that cannot be readily or clearly deciphered. The people listening often translate what they hear completely differently than uh, I would translate what I have heard. This whole area of paranormal research, to be honest, folks, uh, is something of a joke. Most often what is heard is completely up to the researcher's opinion as to what they have heard. More often than not, a clear, full statement or sentence is never recorded, but rather only a small snippet supposedly contain words or a phrase. One of the most popular phrases that you hear coming through EVP that are supposed to be coming from human spirits, think about it. All the time you watch these shows, you've probably seen this dozens and if not hundreds of times. Help me. Help me. So, the, somebody in the natural world is supposed to be able to help somebody in the spirit realm. Where's God? Where's God? Why can this person not say, God help me? Or when they say, help me, why is it God does not come to their assistance? Why is it they have to appeal to the living to somehow assist them in an area that we know nothing about, that we understand very, very little about, from a secular experts position, you know, from their place of thinking and their position. How is it they're supposed to help somebody in the spirit realm? Where is God? Do you see the message that's being set forth when you hear these little blurbs like, help me, you're getting this message that God is not present. This person needs our help. Or that person is here because we need their help. Where is God? For the believer, we understand that the scriptures teach us that we need nothing and no one but God. Our God is so big. He is so grand. He is so powerful. He is so capable that he is able to be everything to everyone simultaneously. He is able to be your protection. He is able to be your comfort. He is able to be your help. He is able to be there for you. He's able to be there for me. He is able to be there for every believer on this planet simultaneously. And as a child of God, we understand that we need no one nor anything but God. 
which is why the Lord prohibited in the Old Testament uh, his people from seeking out conversations with the dead, seeking out mediums, psychics, things of this nature. He said, why would you go to them when you ought to be going to the Lord your God in these areas? Why then, if that be true, why then would you need to have mom or dad hanging around after death looking out for you? When God has said, no, you should be going to the Lord your God for these things. You should be trusting and believing in the Lord your God. The only spirit that the people of God um, have to, that we should ever interact with or seek to interact with, that includes angels. We do not ask to interact with an angel. That is dangerous. That is dangerous because, again, even Satan himself is manifested as an angel of light. You don't know, but that a demon spirit will show up, and you think you're talking to an angel of God. So, no, it is always that God's prerogative as to when we interact with uh, an angelic being. It's always at God's prerogative. He chooses if and when that is ever necessary. We do not ever ask. We do not pray to angels. Therefore, the St. Michael's prayer, no, we don't do that. We don't pray to angels. We don't ask angels to do anything. We don't interact with angels. That is dangerous. No, the only spirit with whom we have to do in this life ever is the Spirit of God. That is the biblical Christian perspective uh, concerning such things. Amen. All right, we are done for this week. We will continue, of course, next Sunday. Uh, excuse me, next Sunday, next Wednesday, I should say. I do want to remind you that Tommy and I, uh, the weekend of the uh, 4th of July, that Friday and Saturday, we're going to be in Kentucky. Uh, there is a church there, that an affirming church that is conducting a conference, and the pastor there was kind enough to ask me if I would come and do a uh, teaching on affirming theology, and I'm thrilled to death to participate in that. Uh, any of you who followed our ministry over the years, you know that there have been a number of times I've tried to conduct uh, conferences and stuff, and uh, it's been very difficult for us to get folks to come out. It's very difficult to get people to participate, and and I've always tried to do them as inexpensively as humanly possible. I've always tried to do it so that, you know, even somebody who was flat broke could come and enjoy it and participate. And still, we've had a very difficult time getting people to come and participate. So when this fella asked me about it, uh, I told him, I said, brother, I will happily come you know, the scripture said, whatsoever you would, the men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. And I told him, I said, brother, I've been there. I've done it. I've tried to put things together like this. Couldn't get any teachers or preachers to come help us and participate. Couldn't get nothing. Uh, it's hard work. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of effort. I said, so uh, Tommy and I, it's about a four-hour drive said, we can easily make that. We'll pay our own way. You don't have to provide us with hotel. You don't have to give us a love offer and nothing. We'll come and we'll do it um, because we want to support you in your effort. And I hope and pray that it is well attended and that uh, he gets a really good uh, turnout from this. But keep us in prayer because we'll be traveling that weekend. Um, we will have church that weekend, so you don't have to worry about that. We're absolutely going to have church. Uh, there will be a service broadcast that Sunday. 
Um, so it's not going to interfere with that at all, okay? But keep us in prayer. All right. Uh, also, I want to say, um, Brother Adam and his partner Brendan in Iowa, Brendan fell, apparently, and hurt himself pretty bad uh, a couple of days ago. He's in the hospital. I'd ask you to keep him in prayer, please. We're praying for him. Uh, here in Alabama. We're praying for him, but I'll invite you to also help us pray for Brendan. And uh, Adam and Brendan live in an area that has been pretty heavily affected, I understand, by the flooding that's been going on in Iowa lately. And so keep them in prayer. There's a lot happening in their world right now, and they need our prayers. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for every single moment we have in the Word of God. Lord, we thank you for common sense and the ability to reason. We thank you for the eternal truths of your Word, which are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. They are solid. They are a foundation upon which we can build. I pray tonight, God, that somehow, some way, the thoughts we have shared tonight have been able to lift up, to strengthen, to encourage the faith, to inspire someone. Lord, someone who may be going through a battle, someone who may be going through a difficult time, those who today, Lord, may be influenced by unseen spiritual influences. Right now, Master, upon the authority of God's Word and in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I speak to those homes, to those individuals, to those today, Lord, who may be suffering under oppression, vexation, even possession. In the name of Jesus, every power from hell is broken. The Word of God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. And in the name of Jesus, I come against every vexation of the enemy. And I claim victory for that individual right now. I claim liberty for that individual right now. Master, chase out by your presence and your power. Let the Holy Ghost descend upon their life. Let the Holy Ghost descend upon their person right now in the name of Jesus. And let the Spirit and presence of God chase out every unclean and evil influence in the name of Jesus. The devil's a liar and the father of lies. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we put our confidence in the eternal truths of God's sacred word. And no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper in the name of the Lord. Master, go with us from this place as always. Set angels round about the people of God. We live in a dangerous time in a dangerous world. We need a move of God in our nation. We need the Spirit of the Lord to intervene on behalf of this country. Lord, our ch the church world needs to be turned on its ear. It needs to return to its eternal mission instead of its foolish uh, games that it's playing these days. Help us, Lord, to live the lives you'd have us to live. Help us to be the witness, the testimony you'd have us to be. Help us, Lord, to be a soul-winning church. Give us souls for our hire. Oh, Master, so many are yet lost. So many yet need to hear the wonderful good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So many it need to believe and embrace this great gospel. Master, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for our friends who have joined us online, those who will join later by reason of recording. Bless each and every one. Bless them with your presence. Bless them with your power. Bless them, Master, with your divine favor as we seek, Lord, to live lives that are pleasing in your sight. 
For you've promised in your word, if we will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things shall be added unto us. We ask all this tonight in none other than that sacred, wonderful, saving name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. I hope you'll worship with us Sunday at 3 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. And I hope maybe next Wednesday you'll come be with us again for our midweek Bible study, Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. Until we see you again, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer.